Uh-oh. All right. So can you hear me in person? Yes, through the mic and also online. Ugh. So welcome, students, colleagues, friends. We are so excited to have you here and online. Um, I'm Professor Janet Elise Johnson. I am the 2023-25 Endowed Chair in Women's and Gender Studies at Brooklyn College. And this event is a part of a series of talks on feminist futures studying Eastern Europe supported by the endowment. Thank you so much to the anonymous donor. The talk is also part of the workshop on gender and transformation in Central and Eastern Europe and Eurasia um, co that I co-coordinate with Mara Lazda from Bronx Community College through the European Union Studies Center at the CUNY Graduate Center. And finally, I have my intro to women's and gender studies class here. So, oh, and then also fans, I think, of the speakers. So there are a lot of different audiences here, a lot of different conversations we can be having and a lot of different ways to communicate. Um, and we will do our best to speak with and to all of you <laughs> as best as we can. Today's talk is about Kristen Godsey's fresh off the press book, Everyday Utopia, what 2000 years of wild experiments can teach us about the good life. Of course, that's actually the British version, which is Everyday Utopia and praise of radical alternatives to the traditional family home which I think we all like better. <laughs> um, and the way that I see this, this book is a, a feminist consideration of utopian ideas about gender relations, families, and other networks of care, parenting, sexuality, relationships, housing, schooling, and stuff. Um, I also see it grounded in Godsey's training and knowledge of Eastern Europe, especially her, um, I was gonna say love, I don't know, of the feminist socialist from St. Petersburg, Alexandra Kolontai. And as she'll probably tell us, the book was a COVID project born in, the, in, in radical hope of better futures. And given all that we've been through over the last several years, the last several days, the last centuries, it seems like a good time to let us imagine um, in these ways. So let me do a little formal bio um, introduction here. So Kristen Godsey is professor of Russian and East European studies at the University of Pennsylvania. And her most famous book, um, is why women had better have better sex under socialism and other arguments for economic independence. Um, and uh, she's written widely. She writes more books than I can count on my fingers. And she's appeared um, just she's an amazing, amazing scholar who's able to communicate in multiple uh, ways to different people about a variety of things. Um, she also has a podcast on Alexander Kolontai called AK47. And she came to us from Philadelphia. And uh, moderated here, um, so Professor Godsey, or Kristen, as she's given me permission to do, is going to introduce the book, and then we're going to open it up to some questions posed by Liza Featherstone, who is my colleague in political science. Um, several years ago, she was a Bell Zeller visiting professor, um, and she's a columnist at the Jacobin and the New Republic, as well as a contributing writer to The Nation. Um, she has her own amazing book called Divining Desire, Focus Groups and the Culture of Consultation that was published a couple years ago and Selling Sh Women Short, the Landmark Battle for Workers' Rights at Walmart. And she's taught at NYU and, and Columbia in addition. Um, and she, her, she wrote in a, in a really insightful review of the book, so I thought it'd be useful to have this conversation together. So we are so honored to have them here and to get us to think more imaginatively about what, what our lives could be. Thank you. Thank you so much for that very generous introduction. <laughs> all right, can everybody hear me? Yeah, all right. So I'm just going to say a few words about the book, and then I will open it up for this conversation because I'm always excited to be in dialogue with people rather than just me speaking unilaterally to an audience, um, since that's what I do in the classroom. <laughs> it's not fun to do that in my spare time, so to speak. So um, Everyday Utopia is a little bit outside of the kind of traditional work that I have done historically on um, sort of the gendered experiences of transition of basically state socialism into whatever came after state socialism in Eastern Europe. This was really a project um, that I conceived of as in a much more capacious theoretical way of really thinking hard about what we could learn from various utopian experiments, really going back like 2,500 years, if not even further, around how we organize our domestic lives. So there, in recent years, there have been a kind of spate of what I call sort of future positive or kind of um, techno-futuristic utopian books, like Rutger Bregman's Utopia for Realists or Aaron Bastani's Fully Automated Luxury Communism, 
Um, Stephen Diamantis and uh, Peter Diamantis and Stephen Kotler have a book called uh, Abundance, The Future is Better Than You Think. There's a couple of these books that are really about imagining the public sphere, like thinking about the ways in which we could reorganize the public sphere, our economies and our polities in order to have this sort of more utopian view of the future. But one of the things that these authors often ignore is the private sphere. And so for me, the, the real focus of this book is the monogamous and romantic couple, which provides relatively exclusive biparental care for their own biological children in the single family home surrounded by hordes of their own privately owned stuff. That model is the model that is often considered ideal in our societies, like it's what you do when you're a grown up. Um, and it is a model that is not working for an incredible number of people, and it is a model that is actually not sure what's going on. <laughs> um, it's a model that is incredibly uh, detrimental for a variety of reasons to the environment. It's exacerbating the epidemic of loneliness and social isolation that we see. It exacerbates inequality, and it also exacerbates the crisis of care, both for the young and for the elderly. And so each of the chapters in this book takes a piece of that formulation. So the first substantive chapter is on housing. Then I look at childcare. I look at education. I look at property, kind of broadly, and possession. And then I look at the nuclear family. And I spend two chapters really kind of digging into the nuclear family and saying, what is it about this model that is creating all of these problems? And then those chapters are sort of bookended by a kind of introduction that says, hey, uh, we're in a very plastic moment. It's often in plastic, uh, in, in moments of great upheaval, upheaval and social turmoil where utopian ideas start to appear again. And it's because the ways that we were used to being in the world suddenly start to feel less fixed than they were. And I think the pandemic was definitely one of those moments. And uh, the final chapter of the book is a kind of call for radical hope or militant optimism. This idea that there's a kind of capitalist realism out there, to borrow uh, the term used by the late great social theorist Mark Fisher, that we often feel in our daily lives that there really isn't an alternative to the way that the world is. And in fact, there are many, many alternatives. And if we can study the history, and particularly the history of utopian societies, we can actually learn that Sometimes what it takes is this sort of radical hope, this radical social imagination for different futures. Even if those futures, even if those utopian visions are always going to remain on the horizon, moving in the direction of those utopian visions actually gets us further along the path than we otherwise would have been had we sort of set ourselves more reasonable goals. Um, and this, uh, this book is very much uh, an argument for basically radical imagination, radical utopian dreams, radical social thinking around so many of the problems that we have today. Because this particular constellation of the domestic sphere that we have, this you know romantic relationship where two people provide relatively exclusive biparental care for their biological offspring in their own single family home surrounded by their stuff, um, is a big part of the problem. And so we need to think outside of that paradigm. And I think that the history of utopian communities, going all the way back to the Pythagoreans, can actually help us do that. So that's the introduction to the book. And I'll turn it over to Liza, who will um, ask me other questions. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so it's, it's very thrilling to be here at Brooklyn College, which um, is my favorite place that I have ever worked, um, to talk with. Um, my favorite scholar. So um, this is very, very exciting. And um, I'm, think, I'm, I'm thinking that a lot of people are probably a lot more familiar with dystopia than with utopia as a, as a concept, just um, especially from high school. How many of you read dystopian novels in high school, right? <laughs> it's a lot, right? The Giver, 1980. Um, Brave New World. So, Kristen, so, I mean, these novels, um, I mean, literature um, ideally evokes a wide range of emotions, but these 
<laughs> and um, and Kristen, can you um, talk a little bit about why these books are assigned to us in school? I mean, so when I was a kid, I just assumed it was because the people in charge of the school system wanted us to grow up, and they missed, they hated kids, and they wanted us to <laughs> have depression. Um, but uh, Kristen has a more compelling analytic argument as to uh, why this is the case, and can you talk about that and how it inspired your project? Yeah, so um, I think it's not just those books. It's like Lord, how many people read Lord of the Flies? And in, in yeah, look, this is a, you know it's an incredibly mandatory text. Um, another short story is, is Harrison Bergeron by um, no no sorry yeah Harrison Bergeron by Kurt Vonnegut. Uh, it's one of the most taught short stories in middle school. And what all of these books do, and, and this is very much a phenomenon of the 20th century. So prior to the 20th century, people were often reading utopian fiction. There were people like H.G. Wells and um, Edward Bellamy and, um, and even Aldous Huxley, you know, later in his life, he wrote this very utopian book called Island, which is almost never taught. Uh, it's always Brave New World, right? So the thing that's interesting about these dystopian books is what they do is they, they have a disciplining, disciplining function. So the world is not perfect, obviously, right? We are very unhappy with the status quo. But what dystopian novels do, and it's not just novels, by the way, it's popular television series like Black Mirror or Squid Game or films like um, The Hunger Games, right? Also books like The Hunger Games, exactly. I mean, so, so there's this way in which we are kind of drip-fed this constant diet of dystopian visions of the future. And what all of these dystopian visions of the future are predicated on is that if you try to change the present in order to make it better, it'll become much worse. That's the message of these books, right? Is when, and, and these stories, and these television series, and these films, it's to say, Yes, the present may not be satisfying to you, but trust us, don't fix it, don't mess with it, because it will get worse before it gets better. And, you know, this is a really powerful message, especially for young kids who are the very kind of locus of social imagination, right? Um, if you think about 13, 14-year-olds who are reading The Giver for the first time, the message of, of a book like The Giver, Lois Lowry's The Giver, is that, um, if you try to make the world a better place, you will be unloved and alone, right? It will be a world devoid of love, devoid of affection, devoid of parents, devoid of coziness, devoid of all the things that children at that age really want. So it's an incredibly powerful narrative. And I think the thing is that we, we, we teach dystopias to children, and we discuss dystopias, especially in the United States, but also in the United Kingdom. I just had this conversation a couple weeks ago. I was in London talking to British kid, British adults who had read the books like A 1984, Animal Farm, or Lord of the Flies as kids. And what it does is it, it, it sort of, it allows teachers and well-meaning adults not to like depress you, um, but to, to like protect you from disappointment, right, in the world. So just accept the status quo. Yes, you know, all in all, you're just another brick in the wall, but that's okay, because it's better than the Berlin Wall, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, um, um, Kristen, um, one of your, um, I, one, I mean, as Janet mentioned, one of your most famous works um, is Why Women Have Better Sex Under Socialism, which is a great book, and I highly recommend it. Um, and a lot of your work has been about these these large, you know, these big government experiments um, in the East Bloc countries. Um, can you talk a little bit about how this book grew out of that work? Sure. Yeah. So, um, why women had a better sex in our social was such a weird phenomenon, right? In in such a it was a great phenomenon. I'm not complaining, but um, but you know, it went on to have a life of its own that I could never I could never have really predict it, right? It, it's now 15 translations. That book is like beyond its original very narrow kind of audience that I was intending it to be, which was like a kind of young American um, activist during the Trump era, right? <laughs> and so, um, but, but that allowed me to then talk to many, many, many different 
audiences in a way that was really informative and educational for me. And one of the things that kept coming up in conversations, particularly with people, let's say, under the age of 30, was that they could see the possibility of a different way of organizing society. But when they started actually thinking about what would have to change in their own society in order to get there, they would say, oh, that's unrealistic. It'll never happen. It's utopian. It's like the immediate knee jerk was, oh, you know, it'll work. My favorite, it'll it's great in theory, but it'll never work in practice. How many people have heard that, right? Exactly. So, so I started really thinking about that. Wow, utopian as a word has such a disciplinary function, right? When you call somebody, oh, utopian, you mean unrealistic. You mean outside of um, the realm of possibility. So, so I started to dig and think about, OK, where are those ideas, and why don't we learn about them in school? Why aren't we taught these utopian texts? You know, why do we learn the Pythagorean theorem, but nothing about Pythagoras's commune and his ideas about gender equality and property? You know, why do we learn um, the allegory of the cave when we read Plato's Republic, but we don't learn about his experiments with, like, family abolition? There are all sorts of things about people that we read. We read them very selectively, and we kind of ignore their more utopian side. But the other thing that happened, so, so part of that was like to actually explore what it would mean to do, to take utopia seriously as an inspiration. But then the other thing is that Why Women Have Better Sex Under Socialism was very much a book about social policy in some way. What we could do when we address claims for expanded social safety nets, for instance, or certain kinds of policy programs or entitlements that would make our everyday lives much easier, that would deal with various forms of structural discrimination. It was very much addressed to the state. And as I was reading all of, you know, some people during the pandemic made sourdough, you know, some people were brewing kombucha. I was reading about utopian communities. That was my pandemic thing. I started to realize that there's this whole other tradition of, and it, this really also came very specifically from reading people like Bakunin and Kropotkin and some of the anarchists, of prefigurative politics, of this idea that actually we can start to remake the world in the way we want it to be without the state. If for some reason the state is not responsive to us, or the state ignores us, or the state is you know, just somehow impenetrable, you know, which sometimes the state can be for different sorts of reasons, what can we still do in our own lives? So where Why Men Have Better Sex Under Socialism was a book that was really kind of about top-down solutions. I mean, or at least solutions that address the state and then allow the state to act democratically on behalf of its constituents. This book is about what if there's not a state or what if there's a state that's not listening to us? What can we do? How can we we reorganize our daily lives in such a way as that we can absolutely instantiate changes and really significant changes in our life just by changing the way we live, the way we dwell, where we dwell, how we raise our children, how we share our property, and the people that we consider to be our family. So along those lines, um, I mean, obviously, I, I don't want to... Um, no, don't want too many spoilers and do want you all to read this book. But can you talk a little bit about what were, you know, in your reading on Utopias, what were some of the specific examples that inspired you the most? Yeah, so, you know, I, again, like I say, I like go... What, what should we be learning in school instead? Right, what should we learn? Yeah, so we should totally be reading Iambicles, the uh, and the Life of Pythagoras, this uh, third century AD text that really sort of reflects back not only on the way the Pythagoreans lived, but on how Pythagoras and his way of life actually ended up influencing Plato in, when he was writing The Republic. And of course, Plato's Republic then influences Thomas More's Utopia in 1516, um, which then influences uh, Tommaso Campanella's City of the Sun in 1602. And what's so fascinating about all these texts, right, is that, you know, and then we could talk about, like, um, all the texts that appear in the aftermath of the French Revolution, Charles Fourier and the Saint-Simonians and people like Owen and Flore Tristan, um, and then on into the 19th and 20th century with the anarchists and the communists and the socialists and the social democrats. So there's this really interesting long historical tradition. You know, and it's interesting, like, in, um, in, 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 
there, there's this thing called the Alexander um, Garden Obelisk, uh, which is a, a, a monument that the Bolsheviks erected, I think, in 1918 to celebrate the one-year anniversary of the revolution. And, and it's really interesting because they actually have names of people on that who are like kind of the intellectual inspiration and it includes people like Thomas More, which is an and, and, and anarchist who you wouldn't think, right, would um, have been inspired, you know, given what Bolsheviks later thought of anarchists. Yeah. So, so, so there's this really interesting intellectual tradition. But the key thing is that, and then I also do something really radical in the book, I think, um, which is that I include religious communities. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I, I have a reading of pre-325 Christianity um, which is like pre-325 Christians were basically a weird utopian sect, um, as were early followers of the Buddha. Mm -hmm. um, they, they, had, they were really in tension with the mainstream societies within which they existed. Um, they lived communally. They shared property. They, they, they were often chased. Um, so they had really different views of how you would organize society. And then they, and then I trace those all the way through like the Bogomils, which was an 11th century Bulgarian sect, which ends up in Northern Italy. And then in Southern France, they become the Cathars or the Albigensians, which the Catholics completely annihilate in the Albigensian crusade. Um, today, there are Hutterites and Bruderhof. Uh, these are groups that I call Bible communists because they basically own all their property in common and they raise their children collectively. So. There are these strands of utopian thinking that are secular and spiritual. And what they all share is this idea of living in a larger group of non-consanguineous people, so not blood related, where you're sharing property to various degrees um, and you're raising children more collectively. And you have a much more expansive idea of what family means, right? So that even in Cenobitic monastic communities, so these would be early Buddhist communities or contemporary Buddhist communities or contemporary uh, communities um, of nuns or monks or priests, even if they're cloistered, they raise children. Right? They take in orphans, they take in unwanted children. And so what you basically have when you look at some of these cloisters is a group of not blood-related people living together and raising children collectively, and they own their property in commune. They're, to in common. they're totally communes. But because they're, what's the word, like um, cloisters, right? because they're religious communities, we don't actually think, we don't include them in for instance, Twin Oaks in rural Virginia, which is what we would call a proper intentional community where you have about 120 adults uh, and children who are living together, own all their property in common, raise all their children collectively, um, and have existed for now more than 50 years, right? Um, and then there are experiments in France, a follower of Fourier, a guy called Andre Godin, who had a, a utopian socialist community for 109 years, which is really remarkable. We don't hear about these communities. So, but the thing is that... And one of your lay nun... Um, the Beguines. They, they lasted like 300 years. 300 years, yeah. yeah. A group of, a group of uh, women who were um, in the Netherlands, in Belgium, and in northern Germany. And they, uh, these were women who would join what was essentially a convent, but they were not required to give up all their property to the convent, and they could basically leave at any time, even to get married. Mm -hmm. So it was basically just sort of like a woman's collective that was like kind of under the auspices of the church, which is why they were excommunicated and banned. Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of, uh, it was very attractive to women. And these women, they brewed beer, they made lace, they ran schools, they, uh, they healed the sick. And interesting thing was that sick people didn't go to the beguinage the begging nuns visited sick people in their homes, which was like very weird for single women. They went in pairs, but still, that they moved through medieval society with such freedom that was really complicated for the Catholic Church. So there are these really long traditions of these, and then you know we can we can talk about um, all the Anabaptist groups in Central and Eastern Europe, 
which were also, you know, kind of communist uh, Protestants or proto-Protestants. And, and, and they were all profoundly influenced by, you know, various interpretations of various verses in the Bible, which say really clearly, Acts 2 and Acts 4, that the apostles of Christ basically lived in a hippie commune um, and shared all their property in commune. I mean, it's, it's there, you know. Um, and, and, you know, contemporary Catholics and Protestants try to, like, ignore those um, verses, uh, but they're there. And, and, and so there, if you look at this sort of long history, both in Western and non-Western traditions, this same set of ideas keeps reappearing. And, it, and every time it appears, it gets sort of marginalized as, oh, that's a utopian way of living. And yet it persists over time. And, and one of the things that this book is trying to do is excavate all those different examples and all those different historical and cross-cultural contexts to say, maybe this is a lot more natural than we think it is. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was thinking reading your book how, how nobody gets together and makes a utopia and says, you know what, let's, let's make a utopia where we're even freer to sell our labor. No. Right. <laughs> Nobody, you know, does nobody does that, you know, or you know, or where we have even stricter rules about how nobody can touch our stuff or right. like our women or whatever. Yeah, like no one, no one does that. No, no. And in yeah. fact, you know, if you go back and you read something like the Rule of Saint Benedict, right? The Rule of Saint Benedict is this 530 AD text written by a guy called Saint Benedict of Nursia, uh, and it's it's a text that is about the ideal structure of a community for a bunch of not related people to live together in harmony with each other and with nature. And then in the 9th century, between 820 and 830 AD, there is this really interesting thing called the Plan of St. Gaul, which is an idealized architectural plan for the perfect Benedictine cloister. And it's sort of a, a architectural envisioning of what you could um, how it would be to actually realize the rule of St. Benedict in architecture. And it's fascinating because, of course, everything about the rule of St. Benedict, I mean, it, it, it could be like the bylaws of, of um, any sort of communal uh, activity because it's all about, you know, being nice to each other and sharing. And But the, the key thing, which I find hysterical, is if you look at this um, plan of St. Gall, what do you think the key thing architecturally for a group, a large group of people living together in harmony is bathroom. Mm -hmm. They knew it in the ninth century. Mm -hmm. This plan has toilets all over the place, which I find so funny, right? That is so funny. Yeah, so it's like yeah. lots of bathrooms, right? If you have lots of bathrooms, people will get along. If you have few bathrooms, people will not get along. Bathrooms are really important, right? So, yeah. and, and that's, and we've known that since the ninth century, right? So I think that, you know, there are so many, like, why are we constantly reinventing the wheel here? And, and the other thing, you know, that I think is really important, and I hope, is, is the sound working? I hope the sound is working. I hope it didn't, it didn't do this. So, um, is that, like, there, there are ways in which the, the model of the family, the model of private life that we have is very much suited to the 20th century. It's a very 20th century idea of how the world is better off by unlimited economic growth and the earth is abundant in its resources, right? And so those two things are kind of assumptions about how we organize our life, right? So we all want to have our private homes and our private cars and our private washing machines and our private refrigerators and our private everything. So... As we move into the 21st century and we think about, again, I think there are four sort of big crises facing us. The climate crisis, the epidemic of loneliness and social isolation, the crisis of care, and the crisis of inequality, growing inequality. All of those things, in one way or another, are impacted by living with more people. Right? Yeah. Very easily. You fix it. And it's such a small thing. Instead of two people living in two separate houses and heating and cooling those houses separately, if they live in the same house, that's half of the energy that is used. Not to mention all of the appliances. I just recently had to replace my refrigerator. 
I went to the appliance store. A brand new refrigerator, you know, it has a lifespan of 10 years. And then it goes to landfill. And there are pictures of landfills filled with like washing machines and dishwashers and refrigerators. It is an incredible amount, of, not to mention snow blowers and lawn mowers and things that are easy to share with your neighbors, right? So, so, and then social isolation and loneliness, like, duh, obviously it's much easier to not feel lonely when there are like other people around, right? You don't have to schedule a, a coffee date like four weeks in advance and then one of you is going to forget or flake or whatever because something is going to come up. And then um, uh, the crisis of care. Obviously, if we were living in much more capacious communities, these could be multi-generational, these could be chosen family. There are all different constellations that we could think of. It just, it takes a village, right? There's that cliche. It's so much, we're cooperative breeders. Allo parents are sort of born and bred into our evolutionary anthropological makeup. So if we had more adults around, it would be easier to raise kids. It would also be easier to take care of the elderly. The elderly could help with the kids. There's so many different ways in which the crisis of care is exacerbated by our single family homes. And then finally, and I think kind of most importantly and perhaps most um, controversially, I can say, is that the nuclear family is the unit in society that facilitates the intergenerational transfer of wealth and privilege. That's how we, that's how, I mean, 60% of American wealth in 2018 was inherited. 60%. That is a huge percentage of wealth that is just being passed from parents to their children, right? And, um, and so the nuclear family is this really interesting box because when we're young and we might be at university or we might be in our 20s living in a flat share in a big city, we can live more communally. When we get older, right, after you know, there's these like over 55 communities, there are these senior communities that are sort of like fancy dorms or whatever, we live more communally. But it's at this moment when we're raising our children where we tend to isolate ourselves. And the reason we isolate ourselves in these really crucial years when our children are growing up is because other families are competitors for scarce resources in our societies. We're constantly trying to get our kids into better schools. We're trying to get our kids, you know, better, you know, better position on the soccer team or, you know, uh, playing first violin in the orchestra or whatever it is, right? Um, and so parenting in the United States in the 21st century is a contact sport. And, and so the nuclear family is where that, if you expanded your identity as a community member to like include other children, it gets harder to exclude them from the resources that you want for your children exclusively. And so there's a way in which all four of these sort of big crises can be dealt with with like these really small changes. Now, there are, there are obstacles, but I'm just saying that it doesn't require the state to make those changes. It's things that we can do in our own lives right now by just sort of kind of rethinking why it is that we live the way that we live. Lived in a... Um, utopian community or thought about it? Yeah, so um, many, many years ago, many years ago, um, I lived in a fully communal, um, basically a commune, um, and, but that was for a very short period of time. And then uh, when I was in grad school at Berkeley, I lived in what you might call like a cooperative house where we ate four meals a week together, and um, there were four of us, so each of us cooked for the other three you know, on a rotating basis. We did all of our grocery shopping collectively, and we did all of our sort of chores collectively. So we didn't eat together Friday or Saturday nights, because like, yeah, <laughs> we were in uh, grad school. And, um, and that was a really great model for, because it, I mean, it worked when we were single. It got complicated when partners got involved, right? Um, and I think that I, you know, there are, um, I think it was Vivian Gornick who had this idea of sort of an older artist community, right? Uh, she, but like there were like um, real estate problems with how to find a place that could house a community like this. In Paris, there is a community of older women. Um, they have a collective house called the Maison de Baba Yagas, which I think is a great name. Okay. Um, 
And they actually had a big fight with the Paris Municipal Council in order to get it organized, but they did get it organized in the end. Um, and they live together. And I've always thought that, you know, as I get older, who knows, right? Like having that kind of community would be really, really great. But that being said, with the exception of one year uh, where I, where I, my daughter was four, five, four, five, and I lived in what was sort of an academic commune um, where, you know, we had a uh, Basically, this was in, 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 in Princeton. It was very fancy, but it was, we had all, everybody had the same apartments with the same furniture and the same carpets and the same curtains. It was like kind of really uncanny with the same dishes so that you could walk into anybody's house and you felt like exactly like it was your house. Mm -hmm. And we had shared laundry and we had shared vacuum cleaners and things like that. Um, except for that one year and like the daycare, it was like where I lived. I used to joke that if I had a crane, I could like pick my daughter up and like go like that just like drop her in the daycare it was that close to my house and then my office was just walking distance it was just a, it was a beautiful idyllic year I did what everybody else did I lived in a single family home right oh there was an option no no I'm saying like I oh. didn't ha I mean like oh. when w without my daughter like oh. there was that that uh -huh. one year I was single I was a single mom that year um, and I lived in a, I didn't have a car. I mean, it was like a, a, it was like the closest to kind of communal living that you could get. But outside of that one year, when my daughter was still at home, I did the thing that everybody else does. Because it's really hard to find people to be like, hey, do you want to raise our kids in common? <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah, it is. It's a very intimate yeah. thing to ask. It is a very intimate thing to ask. Yeah. 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 Um, so, if you were going to, um, if you were going to find an ideal place of communal joint account, um, what, um, how would your joint property still be in the form of joint accounts? Bathrooms. Bathrooms. <laughs> <laughs> I think the key. Um, so, uh, one of the things that I talk about. So, I, so far in this conversation, I've been talking primarily about like intentional communities and like full communes. But there are all, all sorts of things that are intermediate, right? So there are things like, they call them mommunes, right? Where a group of single moms would get together and buy a house and they're not necessarily raising their children in common, but they're supporting each other as single moms. And, um, and this is becoming increasingly popular. Um, there are things like platonic parenting, people who decide to have kids together but are not necessarily a romantic couple. There are um, co-living facilities where it's basically kind of a fancy urban dorm. This is much more popular in Europe than it is in the United States. There's also co-housing. Yeah, there, in, in New York you have it. And in Los Angeles and San Francisco you have it. It's not as common in other places, but it's growing. Um, and But co-housing is this really booming thing. It's, again, very, very popular in Europe. It's starting to become very popular in the United States. There's a whole architectural firm here dedicated to this. And what this does, and I visited this community just outside of Brunswick, Maine, called Two Echo, where it's like this, it's this, it was an old dairy farm, and a group of people got together, and they bought this dairy farm, and they built these sort of small, kind of humble, single-family homes that are really kind of close together, and then they have this huge kind of common house, which has got a big cafeteria and kind of an auditorium, and there are a couple of guest rooms in there, and then there's a playroom, they have these uh, big communal soccer field. They have acres and acres of trails. They have guard, community gardens. Everything is owned collectively. And then the entire community is pedestrian. So you have to park at the edge of the community. And everything, I mean, you know, there are some exceptions where, like, if you're going on vacation or you, you know, bought a new refrigerator or something, you have to get it to your house. But for the most part, people park on the outskirts and they have wheelbarrows that they bring their groceries in and out. So it's this incredibly capacious community. And um, it, it's, it's like kind of the best of both worlds. So you have your bathroom, you have your kitchen, you have your bedroom. Um, but the minute you walk outside, you're in this on this beautiful dairy farm in the middle of Maine. Um, and you have community all around you. Um, and they have, you know, allotments in the garden. And they have regular meals together. And they have... Um, you know, unlike some co-housing communities, Twin uh, Two Echo doesn't have labor requirements. Some places have labor requirements, like, for instance, but but that's because people at Two Echo actually have like jobs in the actual economy. Um, 
people at Twin Oaks, actually, everything is on the, on the intentional community. And they have, like, 42 hours of labor requirements a week. But that includes care work, right? So if you're looking after your kids or you're looking after, you're taking an elderly um, resident to the hospital or to a doctor's appointment, all of that counts towards your labor requirement. Which is, like, the exact opposite. Exactly, exactly. So for me, I think, you know... Um, I, I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about all these different models and because I'm a writer and because like, you know, sometimes I got to close a door and I got to focus and, and write. I like the idea of having that mixture of private space and a bathroom yeah. <laughs> um, and then, and then having everything else sort of be common, right? So that you have the moments where you can be in your space. retreat, um, But then it's so much easier to, to walk outside and again, I think it's important in, in various presentations that I do that are like more formal lectures, I spend time talking about the empirical evidence because there is empirical evidence on quality of life in intentional communities and quality of life in co-housing communities. And it's very clear from the empirical studies that have been done that people report higher quality of life, right, without and lower carbon footprint, right? So those two things, like they don't, you don't give up much. I mean, again, it's different people have different tolerances for how much community they want to be in. But this sliding scale model really helps you understand that there are so many different possibilities from the way we actually live yeah. right now. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, um, family abolition, Yeah. Right. Um, and um, um, and the uh, and the communists often debating whether that's what they were doing, right, with their uh, with, with their policies. Um, and um, and and then it's sort of there's been sort of a revival in thinking about it. Mm -hmm. um, on the left, you know, people have been you know writing books and articles and you know, thinking about how the nuclear family is an obstacle to our collective thriving. Um, and um, and you um, in discussing um, these models um, brought up a, um, an interesting alternative frame, family expansionism, mm -hmm. which I found so um, interesting and much more compelling. Can you talk a little bit about that. Yeah. So I mean, I think what I want to talk about, you know. There are these different models, and historically, people like Engels, people like Babel, people like Kalantai, right, were really talking about taking the family and all of the labor that is done in the family and sort of socializing it, right, so that the family doesn't become this place of, of um, not only the reproduction of intergenerational wealth and privilege, but also the site of the product, social reproductive labor that's necessary for bearing the next generation of taxpayers and soldiers and consumers and workers and things like that. Um, but this requires this radical social model, right, which is where Colin is talking about building kindergartens and creches and public cafeterias and canteens so that women won't be cooking at home, everybody will go out and have dinner in a restaurant or whatever, or in a cafeteria or something like that. Um, you know, that's one model where you, where the, 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 the sort of the quintessential functions of the family are taken over by the state in some way or by society. And, you know, different people, social democrats, communists, uh, uh, anarcho-syndicalists, they all have different models exactly how this is going to work out. But, but there's this idea of sort of like diffusing the social reproductive labor into the, into the wider uh, part of society. So... Because this book was about the utopian imagining, right, I was really interested in models which messed with the nuclear family from a different perspective, right, which is that it's evolutionarily, from an evolutionary anthropological point of view, it's alien for us to be in a nuclear family. Like, it doesn't jive with the way we are historically doing things, right? If we look back at the record, there's a very specific set of circumstances under which socially imposed universal monogamy and the nuclear family arise. And it has to do with like plow agriculture and the Catholic church, um, which is really random. But 
But, uh, I think that our part of most of our Yeah, right. I mean, plow agriculture in the Catholic Church, it has a really important part of our history, but it yeah. is not a daily thing that most of us interact with, right? Um, so, so the thing that's really interesting that I, that I like to talk about is I think family expansionism for me is disentangling our romantic relationships or our, what I call in the book our mating practices, because I'm talking from an anthropological perspective, from our childbearing practices, right? So there are lots of mo models for us. We could be um, celibate. We could be in a monogamous pair bond. We could be polygamous or polyandrous. We could be polyamorous or kind of uh, facilitating some kind of more group concept of, of mating, marriage. Those different possibilities are not in any way necessitated for the production of children, right? We are cooperative breeders. If you read, um, you know, books like Mothers and Others, and you look at the work of people like Karen L. Kramer, these are evolutionary anthropologists and primatologists who are looking at the history of human breeding practices writ large, we always raise our children with a much more capacious group of allo parents. Always. Like that saying, it takes a village, it's literally what that means. It's like that's how we did it. There were grandmothers. Grandmothers are very important. There were older prepubescent siblings, very important, but there were also cousins and there were also um, aunts and uncles and then there were just like neighbors and people that happened to be around that provisioned our young. The reason this happens is because unlike uh, our primate cousins, human babies are essentially born premature, premature, so they have a longer period of dependence because of our heads. Um, and we also have babies much closer together than other primates do. So there's just no way that exclusive biparental care would be sufficient to feed and provision and protect the number of children that humans have naturally without birth control, right? It takes more people, right? Um, especially if the if the um, the mother is you know nursing, especially if she has multiple children, right? Because twins happen and things like that, right? So, so what I think is so interesting to me is that we in the West particularly, but I would say because of imperialism and colonialism and the, and the legacy of what the indigenous scholar Tim Call, uh, Kim Tallbear calls uh, white settler sexuality, we have this idea that the romantic relationship is the appropriate container for parenthood. And that that's the only appropriate container for parenthood. And I think that the key thing is that we could live our romantic lives in any way that we want, um, and that actually romantic relationships are fragile, mm -hmm. and they're maybe not the best container for parenthood, right? Mm -hmm. And that even more so, parenthood often puts a strain on our romantic relationships. For those of you who are parents, you will know this, right? It's hard. Parenting is, 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 takes a lot of uh, effort. And, um, and, and without other people, grandmothers, uh, godparents, right? I mean, you know, again, many uh, very conservative religious traditions will allow for an extra set of parents, right? Just because they know sometimes kids need an extra set, right? It helps not only the kids, it helps the parents. And we, and you know, again, as a social scientist, one of the things that would be really you know, totally unethical to do would be to take, you know, a group of babies and have them be raised by exclusive by parental care by their parents and then have a control group of babies <laughs> that are being raised by a group of loving, caring adults, including grandparents and aunts and uncles and godparents and neighbors and school teachers and daycare, right? And then to see which one of them is kind of like better off from a psychological and cognitive development um, perspective. We can't do that study, <laughs> obviously. But we had a proxy for it during the pandemic. Right. Because babies that were born either immediately before the lockdowns or during the lockdowns are cognitively delayed. Yeah. That's empirically demonstrable now. So we know that children need other caring, loving adults in their lives. And that the way we do parenting actually is harmful to our children. And I think that's the kind of thing that, like, you can't ignore the empirical evidence, right? I think maybe it's time to ask some questions. And we're gonna, I'm going to pass around the mic because I think of all the technological stuff.
So I'm hoping that my students or some folks, does anybody have a question that they're thinking of right now? Wait, oh yeah, I'm gonna bring you the mic. Um, when you were talking about the like crisis of loneliness um, with the nuclear family and causing a lot of loneliness, it made me think of how I feel like this is something brought on by more of a westernization because, you know, in a lot of like, I think of like um, South Asian countries or even in Puerto Rico where I'm from, like a lot of people have this community of allo parents. Um, you know that community where everyone raises their children and like that. So I, I don't know, how have you kind of interpreted that thought into your writing in the way that I believe that this is more of a Western issue brought on by Westernization and capitalism. And I would say a very specific American issue. Maybe not just American, but like, I think if we're thinking of that perspective, yeah. Yeah, that, and that's a really great question. Um, and, and, I, and I agree with you, right? So this has to do with this argument that I'm making about inequality, right? So the nuclear family is a precondition for sustaining long-term inequality in a capitalist economy. But it's not just a capitalist economy because it, it applies to feudalism and it applies to antiquity and slavery. So Plato, when he's talking about group marriage, He's primarily talking about the fact that the Greek oikos, which is the nuclear family, that the, the model that has come down to us, socially imposed universal monogamy, it is a way of, of ensuring the legitimacy of sons so they can inherit their father's wealth and privilege. So obviously, in societies where you um, don't necessarily have high levels of inequality, um, that are, you know, or, or let's say subsections of societies where you don't have that, the nuclear family is far less important, right? So um, the uh, anthropologist at Harvard, a guy called Joe Henrich, he has a really interesting book called The Weirdest People in the World, weird in all caps, which stands for Western, Educated, Industrialized, Rich, and Democratic. Those are the people that you're talking about, right? And, and those are not only people found in the United States or in the United Kingdom, but they're the elites all over the world who aspire to be weird, Western, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. Maybe democratic, not so much. Um, but, but he makes this argument, and it, it's a fascinating argument, because he sees the nuclear family as the reason why the West is better. Right? And he talks a lot about the history of the Catholic Church and the banning of cousin marriage and the fact that we don't alloparent our children. And so when we don't alloparent our children, individual people can build up wealth, which then becomes intergenerational wealth, which allows us to become wealthier societies, more successful. I mean, this book is really interesting in all sorts of ways. So I actually don't necessarily disagree with him, but he takes as a, as a, he takes it for granted that economic development, unlimited economic growth is a good thing, right? Um, and, but he says, Westerners are weird. They're an aberration. The rest of the world doesn't live like we do. And, and I think that that's absolutely right. And the reason is because for so many other cultures, community is more important than wealth accumulation, right? And the irony of that is that another co colleague at Harvard, Robert Waldinger, who is the current director of the um, Harvard Study of Adult Development, which has been going on now for over 70 years, and it has been tracking all these Harvard students over longitudinally over this long period of time, plus their wives, plus their children. That book came out at the beginning of this year in 2023, and it's very clear empirically that it doesn't matter at the end of your life what wealth you have, what job you have, what status you have, what cars or houses you have. The thing that predicts happiness in life is your relationships. It's very clear that the most important thing is relationships. But we live in a society which attributes status and social validation to people who have stuff and not to people who have robust relationships who have lots of friends, who have great relationships with their family members, with their neighbors, with their colleagues. That is not valued in quite the same way. And, and I think very profoundly in other cultures, 
they have a more capacious understanding of what human life is about. And that is a function of the atomization and the neoliberalization of our economies. Because even, you know, even conservatives in this country, for instance, will look back to the past and talk about, you know, commu more community that used to, you know, people like David Brooks will say the nuclear family was a mistake because we used to live in these much wider networks of love and care. But they're looking to the past, to a past set of gender relations, to a past set of structural relations of inequality that I think we should definitely move away from. So I think that we need a, a vision that's positive towards the future. And we can learn, right, much more capaciously from all of these different cultures that do prioritize community and connection over wealth accumulation and the intergenerational transfer of that wealth accumulation, right? I mean, what was that show that was just on HBO? Isn't Succession the whole plot of that about who's going to inherit the money, right? Um, and, and, and two weeks ago, uh, I said I was in London, and I was uh, giving a version of, you know, the kind of talk here, and there was an interesting uh, comment that came from the audience from an older British gentleman who was basically saying that among older Brits, about, I mean, especially among progressive older Brits, they're doing this. They're, they're already starting to buy up properties and try to figure out ways for them to live together because they don't want to age in this isolated way. And um, the immediate objection and, and, or, or, or concern, you know, like concern trolling, you know, um, came from a tax attorney who raised his hand and said, if old people start living together communally, how will they disentangle their resources when they die so that their kids can inherit their money? Oh, wow. And it was like... <laughs> Maybe you're missing the message here, but it was interesting that that was the concern. Right. It was about that intergenerational transfer of wealth that then gets complicated when people start sharing resources. And that's just not true in other cultures because sharing resources is a way that you survive. It's a way that you build community. It's a way that you find collectivity and meaning in life. And, and just to say one last thing about... Um, you asked a question, and I, I had something that I wanted to say, and it was related to this question, but now I've just lost it. It'll come back to me. Anyway, yeah. Um, how do you think the like very recent legacy of state socialism in Eastern Europe is impacting this like simultaneous trend towards further individualism and also trend towards like further communalism. And I guess, how do you see that manifesting as communesque things continue to become more popular? Um, you know, I think that for a lot of young people, like state socialism is just a forgotten ancient history. Um, for my generation, of, of scholars and researchers in Eastern Europe, there's still a lot of Cold War baggage, right? I mean, it's, it's very, very hard to disentangle kind of the larger sort of set of ideological structures from the lived experience of people in 20th century state socialism. And, um, and that is, has been like the challenge of my previous book was I'm saying like, let's like get rid of the bad and like, you know, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. There were some good ideas there. What can we, what can we take and repurpose to think about the future? That always and inevitably comes back to slap me in the face. Because people will just say I'm a communist, right? And and that I'm a, a apologist for Stalin, or or I'm, you know, a, what it was the word fellow traveler. You know, there there are these old Cold War tropes um, that are really really hard to escape, um, and it's frustrating. You know, it's beyond. Fr and then on, the, you know, and and to, and to be fair, like on the other side of that, I've had young people. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the term tanky. Um, I've had tankies, uh, you know, come up to me and, and will try to argue that, like, the crimes of Stalin didn't really happen, that that's, like, bourgeois propaganda, and it's like, no, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, there's a spectrum here, and you have to, you have to acknowledge the bad things. Uh, if you ignore the bad things, you're putting yourself on really shaky ground. Uh, and I remembered what I wanted to say uh, in relation to the other question, which was, and this was also uh, something that I wanted to say to you and then I forgot, 
So I have this new colleague at Penn. Uh, her name is Malika Sarma, and she's a biological anthropologist. And she studies what she calls biology at the extremes. So she looks at what the human body does at high altitudes in space. She actually works with NASA. Uh, she looks at people who are dealing with extreme heat, and she looks at people who are in, let's say, um, a dense rainforest that are dealing with really high pathogenic loads. And what she finds, and she does actual like physical studies, she takes saliva samples, and she looks at cortisol levels and testosterone levels. And not surprisingly, when our biology is stressed by these extremes, and of course, like as we enter an era of extreme climate uh, crises, we are going to be dealing with extremes of cold and extremes of heat, right? And you know, who knows if, if Elon Musk makes us his indentured servants and we all end up in space, um, we're going to be dealing with space too. So, so what she finds is two things. I mean, this is not going to surprise anybody, but it's interesting. So our cortisol and testosterone levels spike when we're under extreme biological stress. What does that do? It means that we are less efficient at using our calories. So we burn more calories, right, um, which makes us less efficient at surviving. And second of all, it messes with our neuroendocrine system, which means that our vestibular function is compromised. The vestibular function is the thing in your brain that helps you move through the world without bumping into things. And that sounds important. It sounds it's really important, right? If you're at high altitudes or yeah, you you, you don't want to like fall off the cliff, right? So so compromised vestibular function and um, increases in caloric in uh, caloric usage are negative externalities of our biology when we're under stress. Guess what mitigates against it? People. Being with a group of people that you trust to support you. And so she does all these team building uh, exercises with people that are, you know, uh, going to do high altitude climbs or working with NASA astronauts and things like that. Because the most protective thing for us is not going to be getting, you know, better air conditioners or installing heat pumps, right? It's going to be relationships. It's going to be being with people who we trust and who we trust to help us. And that's what's going to lower our cortisol levels. That's what's going to make our neuroendocrine system function better, right? It's fascinating when you think about that. As we move into a future where I, our biology is going to be tested, it's communities like the one the ones that you talked about in Puerto Rico, right? Or, or, or communities where people are living collectively and have lots of trusted confidants that is going to be biologically protective. So if you're a prepper, don't hide in a bunker with a lot of guns by yourself, right? The, the best way to prep is make friends and have friends that are going to be with you during the apocalypse, you know, because those are the people that are going to help you and that are literally going to mitigate your biological functioning. And I just think that, that we need to hear that. We need to talk about that. It's not just the empirical data that relationships make us happy. It's that relationships will help us survive. So um, I, I'm going to jump in here. I also have a question on the screen, but... Um, I want to ask you to talk more about gender equality, mm -hmm. right? So, we, you know, you talked about this crisis of inequality and you've been mostly focusing on social economic inequality. Um, how does communal living help the gender division of care and household and other labor? And then I want to kind of throw in a queer question too, like how does it address issues of queer inequality? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, that, that's like a big chunk of this book, which is why I think the British title is different. Um, the Americans went with the kind of self-helpy version of, of the book, and, and the British, you know, really sort of, it said, no, okay, let's talk about the radical alternatives to the traditional family home. And so, I think you said the Germans put it... Even more so. The Germans, uh, the, it is a short history of radical alternatives to patriarchy. So it's a, it's a whole critique of patriarchal family relations. And it's a whole pr critique specifically, I spent a lot of time in the first chapter talking about the twin practices of patrilineality and patrilocality, which are the constituent practices of patriarchy. And so anything 
that disrupts the workings of patrilocality and patrilineality always and inevitably end up furthering the goals of both gender equality and greater sexual equality for people of different genders and sexual. Will you divine those concepts for us? Yeah. Um, so patrilineality is why probably most of you have your father's name um, and why many women uh, who get married to a man will take their husband's name, right? So we trace our descent often through the patrilineal line. Um, and that is a, is a, that is a, that's not um, universal. There are many matrilineal societies. Um, there are, um, you know, societies that don't even care, really. Um, but, but and, and with new archaeogenetic technology, we can study things like mitochondrial DNA, which traces our mother's um, origins, and Y-chromosomal DNA, which traces our patrilineal lines. So we are learning a lot about the history of patrilineality and patrilocality. Oh, sorry, and, and matrilineality. Also, patrilocality is why... Um, when a couple gets married, traditionally, the wife, like the father, walks the bride down the aisle and gives her away to the groom, right? It is a transfer from the patriarch of the father to the husband, um, and then the woman becomes the property of the husband, and her children will carry on his patrilineal line. But that means she is physically removed from her matrilocal kin, and she then becomes a part of the patrilocal community into which she marries. Other communities are matrilocal, right? Where the husband comes and lives with the mother's kin. And we know that in more matrilocal communities, women have greater status. So, and then there are like the Mosuo in China, which are these big intergenerational, multi-generational grandmother clans, which practice a form of walking marriage. There's so many interesting ways of thinking about that. But the key thing, and here, I want to plug Angela Saini's book. Um, it's called The Patriarchs, The Origins of Inequality. And it is a really great, it just came out this year as well. And it's a book about not only the history of patriarchy, but how practices, like daily practices, reinforce patriarchy and how patriarchy is so good at dealing with challenges to its authority. So, so you know, from the point of view of, of, of you know, anthropology, I really talk a lot about how the nuclear family is, in our context, very much a patrilocal and patrilineal and thereby patriarchal instantiation of men's power over women. And that the reason that we have this family form is to preserve high levels of inequality in our society. Right? It's the high levels of inequality that require these particular types of family forms because you are guaranteeing the intergenerational transfer of wealth from fathers to their legitimate sons, which brings me to the Catholic Church. Because the Catholic Church, this is a great little side thing, uh, the historian Laura Betzig talks about how in Europe there was this thing called primogenitor, which is that the oldest son is the one who inherits the wealth of the father. So what that meant is that in European families of wealth, the second son would almost always become a monk or a priest because he didn't stand to inherit anything. But the reason that the Catholic Church was so insistent on monogamy, even though there is polygamy in the Bible, the reason that they were so insistent on monogamy was because if the oldest son only had one wife, he had fewer chances of producing a male heir. And if the oldest son died without the production of a male heir, the entire estate of the father went to the second son and therefore directly into the coffers of the Catholic Church. Yeah. So the Catholic Church had a real pecuniary interest in maintaining monogamy, which I think is really fascinating. Because when Henry VIII, right, wanted to set aside Catherine of Aragon and the Pope wouldn't let him get a divorce, none other than Martin Luther himself told Henry VIII that it would be better to take a second wife, because that's allowed in the Bible, than to, than to divorce. But... So monogamous was Henry VIII um, that he basically broke with the Pope, created the Church of England, and you know the rest of that story, right? And still didn't have a male heir. Well, he did, but it, it was not a legitimate heir, so it couldn't. He, uh, Henry Blount couldn't 
inherit his wealth because it was with his mistress rather than one of his wives. So I'm afraid that we have reached 330 and my students often have to leave immediately, but I just wanted to say thank you so much. We could keep talking about this stuff. There's so much to investigate. Um, I really appreciate this and I hope that all of you are thinking a little bit more imaginatively about how you're going to choose to live and marry and have sex or, you know, and all these different, we didn't get to that much of that. Um, but anyway, thank you so much. Can we thank our speakers, please? If, and thank you, and thank Liza for the wonderful yes. questions. Thank you so much. And students, if you have questions, we'll be here for a couple more minutes. Just come up and chat with us. Um, I, I swear they won't bite. But anyway, I'll see you all. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. That was cool. That was fun.